Lexi is taking a breather, staying off the grid to avoid Nicholas Withers, but uh, she will be back for the next one. Yeah, because really the only safe place from Nicholas Withers is... Well, I don't think there's an end to that sentence, actually. But welcome to Spongebob Boys, the show where we watch Spongebob episodes chosen by a random number generator and uh, try and recount them like the fever dreams that they are to each other. You're goddamn right. And today is going to be a particularly fever dreamish episode because uh, it's the first one where I haven't even needed to drink. All I have here is a uh, bottle of Diet Cola, one of the glass bottles, rather nice. Hashtag not sponsored. And uh, a cup of black tea. We'll just uh, we'll just see how this one shakes out. How about you, Gus? Well, I have decided to, to pimp out my drink this time. I've got straight up dark rum, some Canada Dry, and a motherfucking lemon wedge! My god, we're complete opposite ends of the spectrum tonight. Oh, yeah. You know it, brother. Uh, one more stipulation. This time, Henry and I have the option to, as you know, Spongebob episodes come in two, and we can choose to make one of the episodes we recount entirely a fabrication, because these are late season episodes. Chances are, neither of us have seen these before, so it's fair game to completely make shit up. And at the end, uh, you have to guess which of mine... And I have to guess which of yours was fake if either of them were. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a fun game figuring out uh, the difference between regular new Spongebob surrealness and uh, the kind of surrealness that comes from a few of the minds that bring you less is morgue. Yeah, just the deranged rambling of these guys who also do YouTube. <laughs> Hot damn. All right, would you like to get us started today, Gus, with your uh, first offering? Oh, yes, indubitably. So, the ballpark that I'm looking at is, uh, this is season nine is where this episode comes from, and this is an episode called Don't Look Now. Huh. See, okay, that's fascinating, because when I hear Don't Look Now, I think of the, uh, quite famous horror film inspired by the Daphne du Maurier short story, which is about a uh, grieving couple living in Venice after their, uh, young daughter dies under tragic circumstances, and the father is seeing odd premonitions that makes him think, uh, the, the daughter is still somehow alive, and in the city, but something a bit more sinister is uh, going on underneath. So tell me, does this episode share any DNA with what I've just described? Well, Mr. Horror Buff Henry Galley, as a matter of fact, this episode, Don't Look Now, is based around an in-universe horror movie that Spongebob and Patrick begin the episode going to see at that uh, movie theater that we rarely see in the episodes. But it's oh yeah, the, the famous movie theater that the uh, incredible, uh, like, stinky breath episode occurred in with the, not at all, boy! <laughs> well, that man is a hero. Give him a medal. He really is. That's, that's the man we should all aspire to be. All right, so tell me a little bit more about this one then, Gus. Horace, my wheelhouse. I'm feeling at home. So this, so the horror movie that SpongeBob and Patrick are going to see is something called Fisherman 4. As you recall, the Fisherman franchise is about a man in a boat who sends a hook down and kidnaps sea creatures. That's his thing. He's the Fisherman. He's a horror movie villain. Oh yes, that that classic uh, Fisherman franchise. I really loved uh, Fisherman 6 in particular, where he went to space. And uh, then Fisherman 9, Fisherman in the Hood, which looking back is a bit racist. Yeah, that one was rough. But I did appreciate Fisherman 6 because it's like, whoa, you're just going to create this like elaborate trap that you're going to blow up and it's going to destroy every Fisherman like ever? That's crazy. That's like a game changer for the franchise. Yeah, I'm really glad they brought Clive Barker back for that one. It's no heaven bound, but uh, it's, it's still pretty good. Exactly. It'll do. And then there was the, you know, the Fisherman remake that was just Fisherman. And that one, like, 
I can't believe that they even got away with that. So anyway, SpongeBob and Patrick tell Squidward they're really excited to see this movie and that it's totally not going to scare them. And Squidward, like, just half-heartedly goes, boo, and they freak out and they run into the movie theater. There's, interestingly, there's, like, an anglerfish who works for the movie theater who has his light as a flashlight, direct them to their seats. It's a neat little interesting touch. Already I'm slightly veering towards this is fake because that feels too clever for modern Spongebob. <laughs> like, I'm veering towards this feels like a Gus touch, but continue. <laughs> so anyway, what proceeds from there is Spongebob and Patrick scream for minutes at the movie screen and things just happening on it. You know, the fisherman grabs some kids who are sitting at a teeter totter? They like steal some ice cream from a kid. Tell me what what does this what does the style of like the fisherman look like? Like, uh, do, does it just look like the regular show, or does it kind of differ? I guess I could tell you that it looks like a SpongeBob episode, but slightly grainier. <laughs> like that's that's it. There's no real. It's not black and white. Back in the day, they might even do something like that in like live action. Or, like, with puppetry. They, they might have been clever about it. Yeah, totally. But Spongebob and Patrick are just screaming at this movie. There's a scene where, like, basically what ends up happening is they stay in the theater, like, to watch it over and over again because they, they kept closing their eyes. They wanted to see the whole movie, so Patrick basically clockwork oranges Spongebob and pulls his eyelids up. Both of them are not having it. So Spongebob, with all his willpower, shuts his eyes, and Patrick's hands get caught in spongebob's eyelids and they both scream more it's just, a lot of screaming happens okay all right so anglerfish employee resurfaces he says hey you guys have been here all day you gotta go you gotta leave all right it's the end of our operating hours for this movie theater but spongebob and patrick are like oh it's but it's after dark the fisherman's gonna get us because they spent all day watching this and given the fact that they're like man children they they have internalized the idea that the fisherman is in fact real. This so far feels like an inferior version of Crab Borg. It has so much in common with Crab Borg. It feels very much like a ripoff, but just a little bit like more like straining your idea of like the hooks were this existential threat the last time they showed up. And with the fishermen, it just feels like they get the whole concept now. Enough that they would write a horror movie about it? And like, is this in-universe a slasher film or cosmic horror? It's hard to know. Yeah, and it's and it's the kind of question that uh, modern Spongebob writers really aren't that interested in plumbing either. You know, to be fair, I think H.P. Uh, Lovecraft kind of poisoned the whole fishman thing, so maybe they're good to avoid that. <laughs> but anyway, Spongebob and Patrick ran out uh of the movie theater and for some reason there's a fucking giant clock in the center of bikini bottom that when it chimes midnight a fisherman comes out and like fishes a fish up like a little paper fisherman and they're like oh no the fisherman and they scream and they run back to um whatever their street's called they're in front of spongebob's house Patrick is too scared to walk home alone, so Spongebob offers to walk him home. They go across the street to Patrick's house, and I, I, I bet you can understand where this is going. Yeah, it, it's making me think of, do you know that Key and Peel sketch? Where uh, they've just walked out of like a horror movie, and they talk about how like totally not scare, like like not scary it was, and how different parts of it were so goofy, while like consistently like avoiding dark spots and like leaping into each other's arms. That's basically like what this is, because SpongeBob has this line where he's like, "Wasn't it so cool that we like stared fear in the face and didn't make direct eye contact?" And Patrick responds with, like, it's like we're heroes. <laughs> God, do you know what's funny? This feels like a mix of a ripoff of Crab Borg and another kind of late season episode where the whole thing is them, like, psyching themselves up to go on this really intimidating roller coaster. Oh, yeah! I Oh, I almost forgot about that episode. But yeah, it, it, it reminds me a lot of that one, too. I'm cursed with an encyclopedic knowledge of this show. That's what... Uh, that's what having, like, a 20-year-old brother and having a 10-year-old brother will do to you. So, Spongebob, after he walks Patrick home, he's scared to go home, so Patrick walks him back to his house, and then 
the problem is repeating itself. Uh, as Lexi, as, as Lexi would probably point out if she were here, this sounds like major filler. Yep, yep, it's it's certainly padding. And eventually Squidward has to come out and walk them both home and then go home himself. But not before a character called Slasher McGee shows up. You had the hash slinging Slasher right there. No, so Slasher McGee is a guy who rides his bicycle down SpongeBob, Patrick, and Squidward's street wearing a Jason Voorhees mask? Like, at first, Spongebob and Patrick think, oh no, that's the Fisherman! And then, they're like, oh, that's just Slasher McGee. It's fine. So that's a less funny version of the Nosferatu joke from Graveyard Shift. Uh, so not only <laughs> would you be right to be annoyed at how this is going, Squidward is annoyed that Spongebob and Patrick, like, keep shouting to each other across the street about how scared they are of the fisherman. So he decides he's going to become the fisherman. Right. What is it? We, we release the, release the fucking video on the Donald Trump slasher movie, and then we get this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so Squidward basically goes into his closet, and he puts on his Donald Trump face mask. <laughs> his hands grow three sizes. <laughs> that day. But he doesn't. He, but he does go through, like, uh, there's costumes in his closet of different, like, movie monsters. There's, like, Dracula and Frankenstein and, like, a bunny costume, which, like, maybe is a Donnie Darko reference, but maybe that's giving them too much credit. I feel like that's just rule of three, you know, like, horror, horror, ooh, that's not horror. So, so anyway, he becomes the fisherman, and he takes to his rooftop, like a mad sea captain, on a canoe, and he starts using a hook to fish for Spongebob and Patrick, and, oh god, okay, this next part, I don't think you're ready for this next part. <laughs> I'm scared, hit me. He fishes for Patrick first, and he, like, bangs the hook on Patrick's roof, and Patrick reaches out of the, of his rock home, and the hook goes up his nose. Oh no. Modern Spongebob is so good. So, Modern Spongebob, or your facsimile of Modern Spongebob, depending on what the truth really is, is so fucking grotesque. That's not the grotesque part. The hook is up his nose, and Patrick starts, like, saying shit like, Oh, yeah, that's the spot. Yeah, right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's, like, drooling. I hate too. this. Like, he's drooling a little. And so, Squidward's, like, trying to, like, like, reel him in, basically, and the hook's just, like, bouncing around, and Patrick's like, Getting real- he has a nosegasm, essentially. Oh, I hate this. <laughs> I hate so it! Squidward, Squidward is reeling in Patrick. In more ways than one, it seems. Yes, so Patrick runs in the opposite direction, pulls Squidward off of his house. Uh, Squidward, like, says, like, oh, maybe this was a bad idea. And he's getting, like, flung around Bikini Bottom until finally Patrick runs into Spongebob's house. And, like, wakes up Spongebob. Just trying to think of just Paul Squidward off of his house. But just think of fucking Thor Ragnarok. Oh, your hammer pulled you off. Like, with all the innuendos we've got going on here already. I mean, to be f that that is fair. Like, you know, Patrick gets a nosegasm and he pulls Squidward off. Yeah, Patrick gets a nosegasm and he thanks Squidward by going into his house and pulling yeah, him see, off. Yeah, see, that is nice. That is reciprocal. That is, like, you know, good, careful, like, you know consideration for your partner. We're friends, Patrick. Just friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then why'd you give him the nosegasm, Squidward? It was a platonic nose fuck. Oh, jeez. No such thing. So, so Patrick tells Spongebob that the fisherman is coming, and Spongebob shouts, the fisherman! And then, like, it cuts to Patrick, and Patrick, like, babbles? He goes, like, <laughs> instead of saying the fisherman as well. And then they, like, both freak out and they run around as Squidward breaks into Spongebob's house, prepares, I guess, to torment them more? Yeah, we, this time he pulls out the anal beads and runs towards Spongebob. <laughs> okay, there is another kinky thing that happens, like, almost immediately after, though. So... Patrick's like, I, I, I didn't change my underwear. I don't want to die in my underwear. Like, Spongebob is like, then die in mine. And then they switch under... They take off their underpants and they give them to each other and they put on each other's underpants and they're like, thanks, That's now that's much better. And then they hold each other screaming again. Who is running? 
cartoons these days. I I can tell you, like, it's probably China! The, the, the showrunner of modern Spongebob is just zombie Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, Jesus. I mean, these are like 30-year-old sea men. Sea... sea so, is, 30... They, these are he, sea men, sir. Epstein has been resurrected after his murder to then... Uh, his, his, yeah. Orchestrate a bunch of children's cartoons. <laughs> what do you think iCarly's getting rebooted? Oh, it's my God. In it. Zombie Jeffrey Epstein is behind all of it. Yeah, exactly. Like that Nickelodeon logo, that's just fucking nonce jizz. God, this is just making me think of this, this amazing, uh, where, uh, do you remember the Krusty Towers episode of Spongebob? I do, I do. I do remember Krusty Towers. Someone has edited, someone has made this incredible edit where Mr. Krabs goes, Welcome to the Krusty Towers, where our motto is, Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. <laughs> And it's the funniest fucking thing. And they've, like, edited the sign to say that. I'm going to send that to you afterwards, because that's too fucking It's been good. a while <laughs> since I watched, like, an edited Spongebob. Those things, those are hilarious. The meme culture surrounding Spongebob is still top-notch, because even when they miss, they hit. Yeah, it's like The Simpsons. The memes are better than what the show is these it's days. It's true. Okay, where the fuck was I? So, Spongebob and Patrick just switched underwear... They somehow get it into their heads because of the way the costume is that, like, the fisherman ate Squidward. Like, his head is coming out of the costume. And they're like, we have to save our friend from Vor. Of course. We all have to save our friends from Vor from time to time. So they use the power of football. Like, Patrick says, like, all right, do play 23. And they, like, tackle Squidward. And they, like... SpongeBob like throws him out the window. They like throw a bunch of furniture on him. Patrick does like a Mario style ground pound to him a few times. Of course, that just sounds sexual in this connotation now. I, I yeah, this episode. Patrick like, ground pounds him. This this episode, like I think, just at a certain point, just got too horny to continue existing. And like, <laughs> did Joss Whedon direct this? Well, anyway, so so Squidward is is in a penis coma. Like, he's, he's covered in bandages, and the ambulance shows up to take him away. Epic penis coma. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. if you have a coma lasting more than four hours, nice. <laughs> more than 69 hours. Yeah, you know, that pre rigor mortis sets in. Nice. Nice. So Squidward is being hospitalized, and Spongebob and Patrick are like, yeah, we saved him from the fisherman. And then the fisherman costume itself gets up and does a double scare. And Spongebob and Patrick run away screaming. But turns out, it was Gary the whole time! The funny thing you said about that, um, and mentioning Lovecraft earlier, funny bit of trivia, Gary wasn't always his name. Originally, <laughs> no! before the studio... St no! <laughs> Fucking Vito! Vito! Vito power! Bang, bang, bang! <laughs> I put my veto stamp on this, sir. This bitch. FBI, open up. <laughs> Southern Poverty Law Center, open up. Yes, god damn it. Alright, so so that is Don't Look Now. To be honest, I forgot that the episode was called that, but yes, that's Don't Look Now. Alright, how about we hear from you? What was your first experience? Fuck, sh shouldn't we try to do the guess if it was real or not at the end of each one? Nah, nah, we, we save that till the end. Because I gotta tell you, well, just wait. Just wait. <laughs> Actually, no, that's a good point. Because if we didn't, uh, if we guessed now, because w at least one of them has to be real, it would immediately spoil the other. Yeah, exactly. It would spoil the sport, the sport of it. I'm wondering in my head which one to go with first, but let's go with uh, my two crabses. Oh no, this sounds bad already. Oh, it is. It is. Like, you thought your episode was uncomfortably horny. Oh no. Okay, so I'm just guessing that there's somehow another Mr. Krabs and that there would be fan 
works based on this episode under the self cessed tag. Only, like, for the most genuinely depraved, like... I'll put it this way. If what happened in this episode was somehow translated into reality and this, like, self cessed thing happened, it would be on, like, tier 7 of that iceberg Oh. we covered. Oh, okay. Now I am intrigued. Go on. All right, so the episode starts uh, in the Krusty Krab. <laughs> That's all the best episodes do. The best. Mr. Krabs comes out and says to Squidward, like, uh, oh, no, here's what happens. Squidward watches Patrick eat his food and is kind of disgusted by it. And he pulls out his own, like, sack lunch, and it's got SQT on it, which gave me a little bit of false hope to begin with, because, like, oh, nice. A sort of um, nod to his middle initial being Q. Considering that modern episodes have done things like forget Sandy's surname and call her Sandy Squirrel. <laughs> yeah. you, you learn to appreciate little things like that. But anyway, as Squirrel is about to eat this, Mr. Krabs shoots out through like the porthole behind him and is like, Ah, no outside food inside me restaurant. I'm confiscating this. And he grabs it from him. And he goes, oh, and by the way, Mr. Squidward, you need to take care of everything out here because uh, I'm going to be in my office uh, in a tanning bed getting ready for my hot date. And he bends over and twerks his, like, suddenly, like, realistic, human-looking, dummy-thick ass. Is this like that fucking... With, like, a boing, boing, boing sound effect. Is this like that fucking one-thick bear meme? Of, like, Mr. Krabs? Yeah, no, he, he has, like, a properly thick ass with, like, defined separate cheeks. What is with Spongebob, like, modern Spongebob and just giving people fucking dump truck asses? But this is a bigger ass than we've ever seen before. The, like, this the is... The fattest crab ass! No, this is genuinely, like, the fattest crab ass <laughs> I've ever seen. Damn. Now, now, now I feel unlucky that I didn't get this episode. I mean, continue. He he goes in and he is pulling things out of uh, Squidward's lunch sack, which sounds <laughs> dirtier than it is. Yeah. Um, he pulls out like it's like some kelp chips and then like diet water, which inexplicably has like an Illuminati eye on it. Oh, because that he then throws away. And then, finally, he pulls out, and Meg immediately pointed out that, like, okay, I, I guess what's happening here. He pulls out, like, a comically large ice cream sandwich filled with bright red ice cream. What? And he's like, ah, jackpot. And he's like, ah, strawberry, and eats half of this in one bite. And he's like, haha, that's amazing. Then he's like, anyway, I better get tanning now. And he, like, climbs out of his shell. And again, out of his shell, very defined ass again. Why? But it's, like, flabbier. Oh. But here's the thing. To, to give you, like, an unsettling image of, like... Basically, the whole of Mr. Krabs' back is unsettlingly detailed in its rendering this time. Including, like, you know, like, the like the two, like, dimples above the ass on either side of the spine? I know them. But I wish Those I are the, yeah. did not in this I'm context. I'm a big fan of them. I... But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there they are. And he, like, the his, like, his shell, which is still standing there with both arms up, and the, like, ice cream sandwich in them, he spins the ice cream sandwich and then opens up his desk, you know, like the chest, yeah. which is a tanning bed within. And he climbs inside. Again, a lot of, like, ass jiggling what? in these Why scenes. Why is this happening? This is awful. Because the way that these characters, like, characters like Mr. Krabs are, like, um... <laughs> he is, like, extremely pear-shaped to the point that, like, in a stylized cartoon, you could be, you could assume that he is all ass because of where his pant line ends. Yeah, no, and they 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 play with that in this episode. I don't like I don't like play with Mr. Krabs's ass, please. I don't like <laughs> they it. They really do. 
So so he he climbs in and he's saying like, "Ooh, nice and toasty," and just very just uncomfortable things. And mm. he's like singing. I almost spit in there. my fucking rum, sir. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> And anyway, c- cut to outside where Patrick is getting another meal and SpongeBob hears within. But here's the thing. The sheer heat of the tanning bed causes the ice cream sandwich to melt in Krabs' shell's hand. So it looks like he's got his empty shell with what appears to just be melted crab. Oh, no! And SpongeBob hears him, like, yelling... Because Mr. Krabs is, like, loudly, like, talking and singing to himself inside the tanning bed. And Spongebob and Patrick run in. And they see the empty shell with, like, melted... What, what they think is melted crabs everywhere. Um, Already a big, like, Cinema Sins ding at plot hole. Because they could hear Mr. Krabs singing in the thing from outside. But when they're inside and he's still, like, singing inside the chest... They can't hear that him, which is, you know, just convenient for them to believe he's dead. So they think he got melted by what exactly? Do they know about the tanning bed? I, I believe, like, I'm trying to remember, I think they believe he got, like, melted by, like, stress or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we've all been there. Yeah, we've all been yeah, there, no, haven't no, we? No, I mean... Totally, totally. There were times that, like, you know, it got to be too much, and I just became a different state of matter. There was a time where I went from being known as Gus to being known as Gas. Gusso Milcarella became a liquid. No! (laughs) Every video. Every fucking video. But, um, Patrick sticks his hands in the goop and licks it, and he goes, Mmm, strawberry. Poor guy. Oh my god. Which is just odd. That is strange. And, uh, also, wouldn't that wouldn't he know that crabs don't taste like strawberry? No, because he's Patrick and, and he's dumb. I guess that justifies any writing choice you would make with this character. Patrick is unusually like bizarre in this episode because there are so many scenes like things where other people are talking and you just hear Patrick just going like, oh, oh, in the background. Is he is he okay? I mean, at least like from the sounds of it, it seems like Patrick's not being horny. Like, and that's, that's... No, no, he he sounds like he's sustained... Like, it's the kind of moaning that you'd imagine someone to do after being, like, sustained... Like, sustaining a head injury. Jeez. Like, it's quite uncomfortable to listen to. That's very odd. Oh, it's about to get so much worse. So, Patrick and Spongebob drag Mr. Krabs' empty shell out into the foyer in front of Squidward. And they're like, oh, he's, uh... He's melted. And Squidward, to his credit, because he heard what Mr. Krabs said, immediately realizes what's going on and decides to fuck with SpongeBob and Patrick by playing along with the idea that he's dead. Which, you know, is is in character for Squidward, especially after Mr. Krabs fucked him over at the start of the episode. Yeah, that seems legit. This one, it starts to get unholy in case all the arse wasn't already. They're crying over it, and Patrick says something like, you know, at least we still have his shell. And Spongebob is like, oh, you're so right, Patrick. His shell is still perfectly fine. It's just his organs that are melted. What we need is to get new organs for the shell. What? Wait. So, actual so they're actual gonna... line. They say organs. Are, wait, okay. So this takes me back. Are Spongebob and Patrick about to full metal alchemist Mr. Krabs? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Equivalent exchange. You gotta get the crab parts to make a full crab. Hope it doesn't come back wrong and take your fucking arm. But again, I shit you not, they say we need to get new organs for it. And then speed off. And Squidward is laughing, but then goes, wait, what? Y- After they've gone. Yeah, I'm like, wait, what? Because that's horrifying. Cut to them at the chum bucket all of a sudden. Of course Plankton would have false organs to put into Mr. Krabs. They ask for just a big, like, bucket of chum. That's so much worse. Yeah. And I'll go admit, the one genuinely good uh, joke of the episode is here. Plankton seems weirdly suspicious of them. And he goes, hey, h- how do I know you guys aren't here for, like, ulterior motives? How do I know you're not trying to steal my chum bucket secret formula? There's a beat. And then all of them, including Plankton, start laughing. And then he's like, oh, I'm just kidding. Here's your chum. 
And he takes their money and they walk away with like a, a barrel with like a haz- hazardous material insignia on it full of chum. Mm, okay. And uh, cut back to SpongeBob's living room where uh, they've got Mr. Krabs' body oh. and they take the lid off the chum and they spill it. And what's essentially like blood and gut spills over the walls. I Can I just hold on? The, the part of this that is most disturbing to me, aside from all of it, is the fact that you would, like, take your boss's corpse home to attempt to revive him? Like, that is so beyond the pale, I can't even imagine. Like, that's terrifying. Yeah, it is, but it's about to get worse. So they open the mouth of this new crabs and pour all of the, like, chum and guts in. Then, Spongebob, like, scuffs his feet along the ground to build up static electricity and then touches... This Mr. Krabs full of guts, bringing it to life. That's not even... I don't think that would work underwater even. What? (laughs) That's your problem with this? No! No! That is one of my problems with it. The other problem I have with it is all the other problems I have with it. Yeah. So, this Krabs comes to life, and it's basically just this living blob of organs that is, like, poking out through Mr. Krabs' various orifices and, like, operating his suit like the bug from Men in Black, and it just sort of speaks in, like, a low gurgle. If this is the real one, like, th- I'm sure this would be horrifying to look at. And and if it is real, I'm gonna look it up after. Oh, it's it's very unpleasant, but it's gonna get worse. Basically, they then take this... A weird running thing of mine is flesh homunculi. So they take it. Yeah. And uh, they take it to Mrs. Puff's house, which why is, would, you know. Why? Why would they do that? Why are they bring, Why are they involving her in their fucking, like, like mistake of nature plot? Because that's who Mr. Krabs is going on the date with. And when we cut to Mrs. Puff's house, oh, no. she's got a picture of Mr. Krabs in her house. So presumably they're, like, on a regular, like, dating basis now. That's really sweet, but also super unfortunate. Yeah, it's like, this is the nastiest way to find this out. Yeah. Like, it it would be, like, finding out, like, you got a promotion at work because the guy who had the job you wanted died in 9-11. It's like, I'm happy for the job, but I wish it could have happened any other way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like... That, that's, that's rough. Okay, so what slew of horrors is to follow this revelation? Mrs. Puff doesn't realise that it's flesh crabs and just, you know, starts to go on the date with him, they leave. Cut back to the Krusty Krab. Mr. Krabs, who has one of those, you know those, like, uh, like cooking thermometers? You know, the ones that you jab in, and it gives, like, a ding to show that he's done, and he climbs out, you know, showing he's fully done. And Meg, at this point, brought up the quite valid point, saying, like, what would he need to tan this thing that's under his shell? And, uh, I... Su- uh, <laughs> and I suggested that it's because he takes the shell off to fuck. And I'm just gonna leave that to hang in the air for a <laughs> second. <laughs> I don't like that! But anyway, he realises his shell is gone and panics and is like, well, shit, I might be able to get back home to grab something in time for the date. But he opens the door and the Krusty Krab is still full of people. So he's like, maybe I can sneak past. So he's naked? Yeah. He's naked? He's zipping around, hiding behind different people, and one of which is Bubble Bass with a big defined ass. <laughs> Why? What is with the fattest asses being in this one episode? <laughs> and then Mr. Krabs zips past Bubble Bass and out of the front door. He's gotten out successfully, but his ass cheeks are pressed up against the other side of the glass door. Is he literally dummy thick and the guards are getting alerted? Is that is that No, no it? one is alerted, but he is dummy thick. I guess I'm alerted. I'm on high alert right now. So he returns home, walks in through the front door, and then boom, Pearl is having a sleepover with all of her friends, and Mr. Krabs has inadvertently just exposed himself to them. <laughs> the way this is revealed, I'm, I'm going to need you to bear with me, okay? You ready? <sighs> I'm ready. It is a shot. I'm ready. Where Mr. Krabs is in the foreground. His hyper-realistic matte paint ass is occupying the top third of the screen. The rest is the space under his legs. 
where you see Pearl and her friends in the background. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the... And this was a really good joke from a really good show. But in Billy and Mandy, where, like, Grimm strips down to, like, just his skeleton form because some, like, kids on a playground think that he farted. And he's like, I don't have intestines. And he, like, strips down. He's like, look at my body. Look at my body. Look at it. Talk to him in jail. they run away. Yeah. No, that's exactly what happens. Like, police officers approach him. And he's like, oh, hello, officer. Smash cut jail. It's great. But yes, that's the thing. Like, that's funny because it's someone doing a weird thing, but other people react realistically. This loses that because all of Pearl's friends pull out pom-poms and start doing an impromptu cheerleading routine, mocking Mr. No, Krabs's they don't! <laughs> nakedness. No, no, they yes, don't. They what do. the fuck? <laughs> So, Mr. Krabs runs upstairs and runs into his, like, wardrobe and starts throwing stuff out, much like Squidward, weirdly. And Meg pointed out one of the things he throws out, uh, funnily enough, is the, uh, like, the, like, one of those, uh, one of the uniforms from when Spongebob and Pearl revamped the Krusty Krab. What he eventually goes with, his, like, prom suit from when he was a child, which is too small for him. So he's kind of, like, bulging out of it. I stopped. Don't say bulging. Yeah. Anyway, cut to Mrs. Puff on a great date with uh, flesh crabs that's going really well. I didn't ask this before, but is flesh crabs sentient? Or are Spongebob and Patrick, like, speaking for him in some weird way? He is sentient, but it's like a limited, like, Boris Karloff Frankenstein sentience. Oh, I don't like that very much. Let me describe him to you. He is... So it's Mr. Krabs' shell. He only has one eye and it's on a stalk that basically looks like a tube of intestine with an eye in it. And the other stalk is just like a tube of intestine flopping out. And he's got like a few jagged teeth in his mouth. And you can see like the offal in it behind it. Like, weirdly, it's a bit like that episode of Invader Zim. You know, where he like steals everyone's organs. Okay, so from the sounds of it, flesh crabs is the worst. Go on. Anyway, halfway through the date, real crabs turns up jumps in and is like, ah, get away from my woman, and, like, attacks him. But because Mr. Krabs doesn't have his shell off, doesn't have his shell on, rather, everyone thinks Flesh Krabs is real crabs and that real crabs is the weirdo. (laughs) They they grab, and, like, SpongeBob and Patrick grab and wrestle him out of the restaurant. And it's only when Squidward turns up and is like, hey, that's not the real crabs, they realise. And at this point, Mrs. Puff and Flesh Krabs leave the restaurant and Mr. Krabs and Flesh Krabs get into a fight. But in this fight, uh, Flesh Krabs opens his mouth, and these gut tentacles all start emerging and, like, attacking everyone. St- stop! St- no! No! Like, it's like something out of the fucking thing. You know, the thing where it's, like, the fucking tentacles? <laughs> I'm aware of the thing. I just didn't think Flesh Krabs would... <laughs> Flesh Krabs is the worst. And Mr. Krabs I is stand by that statement. Mr. Krabs is fighting Flesh Krabs, and in the end, he defeats him because the amalgamation of flesh crawls out and starts to try and attack him. However, without the shell to give it form, it just collapses into a pile of sentient guts. I still don't understand how SpongeBob and Patrick managed to give life to this thing. How is this even possible? It would be one thing if Plankton, like, went to the lab and, like, did some kind of experiment and brought it to life. But Spongebob just used static electricity. Yeah, just guts and a bit of electric. Could you bring to life, like, your fucking chicken tendies if you use static electricity? I don't think so. (laughs) Kathy and Benjamin could never. (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) Their setup is weak compared to my boys Spongebob and Patrick. (laughs) Oh, that's not real science. (laughs) Eugenics is real science. (laughs) (laughs) I should clarify, I should clarify, I was quoting 
a character who is a bad person from our show Less is Morgue, eugenics is racist, ableist nonsense, and should not be believed by anyone. And it is definitely, most certainly, not real science. It no, is it, it, science. Is, it is about as scientific as phrenology, alchemy, and, I don't know... These nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's about as scientific <laughs> as the study of Sugon. Sugon these nuts. It's about as scientific as fat asses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which are not science, they're art. Um, anyway. <laughs> I'm just imagining phrenology, but for like... <laughs> let's not go there, but phrenology... Yeah, Jesus but... Christ. Never mind. Fucking... Just clarify, phrenology also racist nonsense. Anyway, um, so Mr. Krabs climbs back into his shell, and he and Mrs. Puff go off together, and uh, Patrick and Spongebob uh, help the flesh beast back into its barrel, and are like, hey, look, you may not have a body anymore, but we're still friends. And two tentacles come out and wrap around Spongebob and Patrick, and the flesh creature says, friends, and then pulls them both in. And the episode ends just on a shot of this barrel of flesh. Well, I really don't like John Carpenter's Spongebob Squarepants, but there you have it. Now, if John Carpenter wrote this, like, John Carpenter in his prime, like, the characters would at least be more likable in it. <laughs> That's true. The, the thing is, I think it's really sweet that Mr. Krabs and Mrs. Puff are, like, going you know, steady. Making it, making it work. Like, I like that. That's That's a neat touch. It's a shame about everything else so yeah that was my two crabses even the title is annoying yeah that like whose two crabs was it because like it really seemed like there could only be one you know that's just the author of the, that's just the writer of this episode speaking in first person these are my two crabses do not steal yeah it, it might as well have been called my first spongebob episode please only positive feedback yeah i'm begging you <laughs> Yeah, um, alright, do you want to hear my next episode? Why the fuck not at this stage? <laughs> We're in too deep. Alright, so my next episode is the very cleverly titled Seance Schmeance. What, what is it with these, like, strange, like, horror episodes? I don't know, but the theme continues. This episode opens on, like, a show within a show... That's like a fake-ass seance where, like, um, a lady who's voiced by the same voice actress who does Mrs. Puff mm -hmm. resurrects the ghost of a guy who didn't replace the toilet paper in the apartment of the person who's there in the psychic booth. It's, it's all very, I don't care. It's all very, like, whatever. Yeah, it's all just not very funny shtick. Anyway, Squidward is watching this on a TV in the Krusty Krabs, and... He's, like, saying, like, I can't believe anyone would be, like, scared by this. Meanwhile, Spongebob behind him is sweating so much that his sweat is like a projectile sweat onto Squidward. And Squidward literally calls Spongebob Moist Bob Drip Pants. I... Why did we choose to do this show? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you, ju you just wonder sometimes. It's like... Well, no, it's, 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 we have to do this show because this shit can't be, like, it can't be left unknown. I feel like we're just playing into their fetishes at this point. Like, this is, this could only be the result of someone with a humiliation kink. Nah, you know, Moist Bob Drip Pants, that strikes me as the name of someone who would never want to, like, you know, do a big sweaty workout while a... While a woman berates them for not being buff enough. You know? Christ. Okay. So, please continue. Apology for derailing. <laughs> nah, it's fine. Because the next thing that happens is the e irrelevant event of an old man coming into the restaurant and ordering, demanding, that he can get a rusty on rye sandwich. God, I, I'd fucking kill for a burger right now. Let me tell you something about this guy who wants to order this rusty on rye. This is something I could really relate to in my time as a barista. Because this dude comes in and he's like, I'd like one rusty on rye, please. And he, like, insists 
that he has to get this sandwich that nobody knows what the fuck it is. And he says it's like supposed to be number nine on the menu. And it's like, it's clearly not. It's not on the menu. Mr. Krabs even comes out and says, sir, th- order what's on the menu, old timer. Like he's seen this all before. But that just makes me think of, that makes me think of this tweet. There's like, I'm, I'm currently behind someone at Taco Bell who is trying to... <laughs> who is trying to order a, quote, Chocobo Supreme and refuses to work with the cashier on figuring out what exactly that is. Yeah, so it's that energy. This old dude's taken so long. This old guy wants his Chocobo Supreme. SpongeBob literally goes into, like, his Squilliam fancy restaurant episode style, like, encyclopedia of recipes. He reaches into his brain, pulls out a filing cabinet, and looks... For, like, the rusty on rye. But he doesn't know it. And the line freaks out. And they're like, dude, order your fucking food! And so, this old man leaves, humiliated. And it seems like everything's gone back to normal. Until Squidward really hammers it into Spongebob. Oh, looks like that customer was unsatisfied. Is is Squidward gonna say, this guy's gonna die now and haunt you for not getting his rusty on right? No, no, but I I see that you remember that this episode's supposed to be about a seance, so moving right along, Spongebob goes to Mr. Krabs and he's like, what about the, like, what's the deal with the rusty on rye? Tell me how I can help this poor old fuck get his (laughs) fucking sandwich! Tom Kenny, uh, on the... (laughs) On on the slimmest chance in the universe that you ever watch these, please record that and send it to us. Yeah, like, yeah, say it exactly that way. Like, Mr. Krabs, how I, how can I help this poor old fuck get his fucking sandwich? It wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the worst thing you've done vocals for, Tom. You were in Transformers Two: Revenge of the Fallen as one of the racist robots, and the and the one RC car who sounds and acts like Angel Dust from Aspen Hotel. Angel Dust, the best character. Anyway, Mr. Krabs says uh to spongebob he like he releases some like deep dark souls lore on the universe of spongebob and says oh well the rusty on rye was a meal that was served in the restaurant that stood on this ground before the crusty crabs it was a place called rusty's ribeye when the with the head chef was a guy named rusty ricketts and he made the rusty on rye. God, I fucking hate that this is making me hungry. At fucking 11.25 p.m. The thing is, Rusty Ricketts is long dead. You can't get the recipe unless you contact the dead. I think you know where this is going. <laughs> this, like, this, this is a running thing, but so many... <laughs> Do you ever feel like a lot of, like, modern Spongebob episodes are things that weren't originally written for Spongebob? But, uh, are just, like, like floating spec scripts that then got rewritten for Spongebob? Oh, no, totally, 100%. Like, these are ideas that never made the cutting room floor in early seasons, and it's like, yeah, here they are, now. The, the Rusty Rickett seance, then. Yeah, so, Spongebob, he calls up Patrick, and Patrick and Spongebob begin to like they they are going to close up the crusty crab but also hold the seance mr krabs also says like hey patrick while you're here don't eat any of my food and also don't eat my furniture and like patrick's very indignant about patrick has just become like a, a badly behaved dog in new spongebob He's, 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 he's a savage. He's barely even human. Like, yeah. Do do you remember when the, do you remember when the central joke of Patrick was the fact that he was a dumbass, but both himself and Spongebob thought he was really wise? Yeah, no, that was great because he would always give this, like, insightful advice that, like, Spongebob and Patrick would take, like, both of them would take it really seriously to the detriment of both of them. But now it's just like, Patrick is just a force of chaos that people tolerate. Yeah, he's he's just the Peter Griffin. It's the, like, it's the inherent flanderization of dumb characters where they just become these untouchable fucking monsters who are just nightmares to be around. Yeah, can I just go off for a second? Because, like, I think there's such a weird thing with, like, smart characters get flanderized into being mean because their smartness 
makes them like they become like rick sanchez they become indifferent to like the concerns of the the dumber people because they're smart but also dumb people become indifferent to like the concerns of everyone else because they're too dumb to understand it so like what is there this middle ground where people are like fucking decent human beings and everyone's who who's dumb or smart is just an asshole? You just get a universe of Rick Sanchez's and Peter Griffins. As many people have said about, like, Mr. Entry's growing around, <laughs> I would kill myself instead of being in that universe. Yeah, I think I'd genuinely rather die. Anyway, SpongeBob and Patrick, they do a ritual, and it's, I guess, really funny, and they, they summon the spirit of Rusty's ribeye back into this world. They create this restaurant in the middle of the Krusty Krabs, uh, Patrick freaks out. He says, wait, we summoned a big ghost? I thought we were going to summon a rib roast. Ah, and he runs out of the restaurant. We did it better with Tiffany in episode two. One million times better. That's a Rick and Morty reference for those who are uh, fucking high enough IQ to... Anyway, <laughs> Rusty Ricketts, the ghost of this fucking ancient chef, appears before Spongebob. What does he look like, by the way? Paint me a word picture. This is Bubble Bass, but, like, he's got hairs here and there on his face. He's got, like, a like a zit, I think. He's, like, I guess I could best describe him as, like, vaguely Cajun Bubble Bass. Does he, ha- does he still have an ass that won't quit? He has no legs. He's a ghost. There's no ass. <sighs> Classic like, ghost. But I bet if he was alive and he had legs, they'd be four days. But that's not as important as the fact that Spongebob tries to communicate with him. (laughs) And Rusty Ricketts, his defining character trait is that he's too Cajun to be understood. That just feels mean. Yeah, so like his his speech is something like, Abba flabba flibba flabba flabba flubba flabba. And it's like, ooh, Spongebob, uh, I don't know about this one. (laughs) Do you know what I hate? Fucking, uh, I don't think ribeye is even like, Cajun food. <laughs> yeah, no, I have no idea what they were going for. Like, like that's like Texas, like steakhouse shit. <laughs> yeah, that's the fucking thing. It's like SpongeBob is a show made in America, but like anything that's not Florida is foreign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, like it feels like this was somehow like written. <laughs> like this is that they they somehow you know how like a lot of shows like this outsourced the animation to like Taiwan or Korea like they got so lazy they outsourced the writing as well <laughs> yeah like this is this is like legit okay so so rusty ricketts too cajun to be understood so is his food okay so is his food the sandwich that spongebob is supposed to make is like plywood and spackle and shellac. That's, that's even more offensive because right now I'm fucking like Homer Simpson uh, over the very idea of a big fucking handful of Cajun fries. Like Cajun food is delicious. Yeah, no, soul food is fucking like lit, dude. And this episode is just like, I don't know, it's fucking like hardware store shit, you know? Yeah, new, new Spongebob, like it hates art. <laughs> It hates, uh, like, food made by ethnic minorities. It does! (laughs) It just... It so does! It's just like, no, sorry, we are dedicated to being anti-culture. We cannot allow any culture into this, like, fucking sphere. It's just this whole thing of, like, breeding fucking philistines. Yes, okay, so Henry Galley, Spongebob is learning the Rusty Ricketts recipe from this extraordinarily Cajun man, and he learns it, D- d- motherfucking guess what happens next fuck um i genuinely don't know rusty possesses spongebob no but extraordinarily close R- we find out that mr crabs murdered rusty and took over his restaurant to make the crusty crab <laughs> no but that would make more logical sense given the characters in layer spongebob okay here's what it is man Two words. Hell spirits. What? Spirits from hell rise up from beneath the Krusty Krab. And they're like, oh shit, the Rusty 
on rye is back on the menu, boys! I can't wait to fucking eat this soul food goodness! Let's fucking go! They they they're uh, taking some time off from breaking into the archivos de morte. Yeah, no. To uh, come and grab some. There's nosh. fucking like eels. There's fucking dragons. There's a creature of the black lagoon. There's like. Do do they at least say like Davy Jones? Locker? No, no. And you know what? Brian Doyle Murray doesn't reprise his role as the Flying Dutchman. They fucking couldn't pay for him. Flying Dutchman is not among the hell spirits. This is a loose group of unmemorable fucking. Boilerplate, like random ass fucking ripoff designs. Hell spirits are here. The radio demon was there. They might as well be. Bill Cipher might as well be there. Well, I say, being a man from New Orleans who definitely sounds like he's from New Orleans, I would love some of this Cajun soul food. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a mouth, but I'm also here. Cause fuck it. And then Sands from Undertale is like, hey, hey, give me some of that fucking nosh. And so these hell spirits. And then Black Hat appears and goes, <laughs> and they they all show up and they start fucking destroying the Krusty Krab, and and they're just throwing things around. They spit ectoplasm on SpongeBob. He's fucking grossed out. He like lies down flat on his back and screams for like a solid minute, and like everything. <laughs> it feels like a lost yeah, episode. Yeah, so everything fucking goes berserk, and then Patrick returns. Patrick comes back. And he's brought Mr. Krabs with him. And so Patrick is useless. He, he he sees what's going on and he runs around again. He goes like, oh no, this is the... P-. He literally says out loud, this is the part of the story where I run around the restaurant and scream. And he runs away and screams. Every time someone lampshades a lazy writing decision, the, the probability that I will one day commit murder grows just a little bit. Like, the, the needle just wiggles, you right. know? So, so, just to reiterate that for you folks, every time someone makes a lazy writing decision, a child dies in the future because Henry Galley will kill them. <laughs> Oh, I love that you, like, go ahead, like, oh, no, <laughs> if Henry was going to be a murderer, he'd definitely be a child murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you know, that you have that kind of faith in me. <laughs> I gotta tug the heartstrings a little bit. <laughs> so, oh, no, Henry's not the kind of guy who'd go after someone his own size. He's he's more a, like, prey on the vulnerable <laughs> Henry in his fucking windowless panel van full of duct tape and knives outside the local fucking daycare. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why should they have their whole lives ahead of them? They don't deserve to be in this world, in my world. That's what you think. That's your MO, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. What the fuck? <laughs> no. Hey, kid. You like Spongebob? <laughs> I saw... I saw this one episode that was lazily written, so now I'll kill you. I have all the depth of a daredevil villain. <laughs> Gee, I don't like where this has gone. This is this has gone from just like SpongeBob to casting major aspersions on my character. <laughs> hey, you once told me I need to get better at slandering, and now I've done it. You have learned from the master. This is going to be today's art. It's just going to be me with a knife. Coming towards the fucking camera. <laughs> I wouldn't do that and, to you. And, and throw more, this... spe- more specifically, I don't know if Meg would do that to you. <laughs> if that does happen, I love the idea of like everyone this whole time wondering, like, well, why has Henry got that knife in the thing? And they got here, like, oh, okay, okay. But they did an extended bit about him becoming a serial child murderer for... <laughs> For lazy writing jokes. You know what we'll do? We'll take whatever the, the premise of the art is for this and then just put, Henry, you with a knife in the corner and people will wonder about it. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. All right, sorry. Anyway, R- Rusty Rusty Rivers or whatever the fuck. Please continue. So he's, he's summoned all the spirits of hell. The spirits of hell are like out and about and they're fucking wrecking havoc and they're going crazy. And so Mr. Krabs, for the second time to my knowledge... He decides to take up arms against the spirit of the undead and he takes a mop and he starts just clearing them out. He like hits these monsters out of the, out of, back into hell. He just, he goes to town. He's killing them. He's striking them down. He sends them all back into the fucking seance crystal ball and he pulls out a needle and he pops the crystal ball and he says to SpongeBob, never host a seance without my presence because if you do, like, 
D- don't <laughs> basically. Have you ever seen um the Mummy uh two, the one with the Scorpion King? The the Mummy Returns. That's it. Is that the fucking horny one? The horny. Well, it's just Brendan Fraser. So yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. What I meant to say was, is that one of the Mummy movies, aka all of them are the horny one? Yeah, it's the one with like big horrible uh, CGI Dwayne Johnson in it. God, I love big horrible CGI Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> 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 my favorite character well there's just this bit where uh spoilers for a fucking 25 year old film where um <laughs> just the where... idea of someone's gonna be offended like like fucking an hour in to spongebob boys that there are mummy spoilers yeah, it's God. like oh you're certainly using your time well I got blindsided by that Mummy Returns spoiler. I was planning on watching that tonight. Yeah, Spongebob Boys but... is so totally like my comfort show. Every time I listen to it, I'm just like wrapped up in a wholesome bundle of joy. God, I love it. But anyway, there's this bit where Brendan Fraser's character, Rick O'Connell, of course, uh, stabs horrible CGI giant scorpion rock through the chest with a magic spear. And he yells... Go to hell and take your friends with you. And I like to imagine Mr. Krabs impaling the lead demon with the mop and using that exact same line on him before they all disappear. I mean, he might as well have. That was the energy of the scene. Restore the Henry cut. That'll be what's in these SpongeBob episodes. Yeah. So the one thing, the one like missing thread left in this episode is that the next day... SpongeBob makes a fucking rusty on rye for that old man and says aloud, basically looking into the camera, and everything was better. See, I think it would be kind of funny if the episode ended with the, like the guy having it being like, eh, didn't taste as good as I remember it. No, no, this old man is completely validated for his fucking weird obsession with a dead sandwich. Like, motherfucker! It just goes to show, you should be rude. To service staff. Oh. Uh, you'll get what you want in the end and you'll be happy. I can tell you this one thing. As someone who's worked in the service industry, this old man should be among the hell spirits the next time someone raises the soul of Rusty Ricketts. <laughs> Spongebob took a shit in that Rusty on right before giving it to <laughs> Yeah, uh, so so that's, that's fucking seance schmeance. Again, very clever. Yeah, it's one of the worst titles. Yeah. Fucking awful. Like, even something like Sandwich Seance would have been cleverer. And that's not even clever. I don't know where cleverness entered into this, because it was just like the writers were like, uh, Hell Spirits! Here they are! <laughs> to be fair, that's what I do when I don't know how to end a script. Just summon the demons of hell. And, I, and I'm not even talking about in the script. I just do that in real life and say, Hey lads, you got any idea how I can finish this script? <laughs> That reminds me of a fun bit of trivia. Have you ever seen the first Silent Hill movie? Yes, I have. Okay, so you know how that one ends with, like, barbed wire tentacle porn? Oh, yeah. No, is it that the alternate ending was that just a bunch of pyramid heads show up for some reason? <laughs> I didn't know that! You reverse Uno carded me! Oh, I thought that was what your trivia was going to be. No, no, my trivia is that the director has, like, said in an interview that there were time constraints, so he didn't know how to finish the movie, so he fucking just ripped off the ending of a hentai he enjoyed. Oh, that's awful. No, the thing is, if it wasn't that, the ending was going to be that just a bunch of pyramid heads show up <laughs> and kill all the cultists. <laughs> That, that is so dumb. There should not be more than one pyramid head. That's like, that's like the Avengers fighting like the fucking 30 Thanos. That's the thing, like, so pyramid head, I'm going to go on a little spiel here because the, the people at home need to know, and let's be honest, you don't come to Spongebob boys for lucidity. In Silent Hill 2, where pyramid head exists, because all the Silent Hill monsters in the good games made by Team Silent, that's uh, Silent Hill 1 through 4, all of the monsters are like specific manifestations of like personal problems that characters trapped in the town have. Pyramid head was uh, specifically for James Sunderland, the uh, main character of Silent Hill 2. Uh, pyramid head it was supposed to represent both his sense of like pent-up sexual aggression but also to act as a figure of punishment 
to punish James as a way of, like, absolving himself of his guilt. So Pyramid Head is this, like, symbolically and thematically a very specific thing for this one character. Yep, but how is he treated in the rest of the franchise? No, exactly. Because he got immensely popular, he just appears anytime because, like, hey, Pyramid Head, you know him, fan service. And so that was going to be the ending of Silent Hill 1, but they vetoed it to have, like, barbed wire tentacle porn. But, I shit you not, the ending of the second Silent Hill film is... Wait, I know this one because this is a bit of a... This is a bit of a deep cut. For a while, there was an in-joke between me and all of my friends that, like, when a movie can't think of an ending, they just end it with a big, dumb pyramid head fight. No, exactly. Like, just... They, they end the movie, just so people have context. The main villain of this movie like, takes on a monster form, which, to be honest, is way more fucking... Like, in this context, it's way more Resident Evil than Silent Hill because human bad guys in Resident Evil, whenever they're caught, will be like, oh, well, fuck it, might as well, and inject themselves with whatever, like, experimental bullshit is the flavour of the game and become a giant monster for a boss fight. But this you person... You know, uh, fun fact, fun fact, Jeffrey Epstein was about to do that before he was murdered. <laughs> Is, is it ex- is it ex- How do we know that pervert mechanics haven't built him this? <laughs> I'm gonna find that clip. Yeah. It's just like, how, how do we know that pervert biochemists haven't designed him this? A powerful mutagen which will turn him into a massively physically enhanced pedophile that is immune to conventional arms fire. Oh my god. So yeah, like, th- this this person turns into a monster, and then Pyramid Head comes in and fights her. Like, this is some fucking, like, Godzilla versus Kong type thing. Mortal Kombat! Test your might. Test your like, might. Like, I'm genuinely trying to think of the thematic equivalent of this, and it would be like if... If at the end of, like, Midsommar, when the cult are about to, like, burn Christian, suddenly in comes Payman, and they have a big fight. <laughs> the only equivalent I can think of is the entire narrative of D-War. That's basically the same level of justification that entire movie gives for its plot. Go down. All right. <sighs> Shall I give you the last episode? Yes, absolutely. Though I think we've got our... Silent Hill themed uh, thumbnail art. Yep, there we go. All right, so you are not going to fucking believe this. I'm prepared not to. I still have to remain skeptical. This episode is called The Ghost of Plankton. Why are they all horror themed? I don't know. What happened? What's he, what's he, why are they all horror themed? I don't know. And That was my Doug Walker impression. Yeah, why does it look like Vegas? Anyway. So- why does it look like Vegas? So the episode starts with... An in-universe horror film. Shut up. Come on. I love that three of the four episodes, three of the four fucking episodes, have started with someone watching, like, an in-universe piece of, like, horror media. Thing is, we would know it immediately if the other person was lying, if either of us mentioned Nicholas Withers inside of, like, the, those things. Because, you know, th- that'd be getting too cocky. Yeah, we know for a fact Nicholas Withers isn't around beyond those two episodes that were in Spongebob Boys 3. That Lexi freakishly managed to get <laughs> in the previous episode. Yeah, like, Nicholas Withers is Lexi's demon. It's not ours. Like, he is specifically targeting her. Yeah, Le- Lexi is fucking battling Nicholas Withers right yeah, now. Exactly. Um, and we wish her all the best. Yes, yeah, Lexi, you can do this. And Lexi, if you survive, you'll be on the next episode. So, starts with an in universe horror movie where a woman is being chased by, like, the ghost of her grandmother. Which looks like it's quite a spooky looking ghost for a kid show, like, kind of gaunt face. And something you have to understand is that for, for reasons unknown, the animation in this episode is, like, freakishly good. <laughs> like, like it, it looks like Ren and Stimpy, like that level of like, wow, this is like incredible, like plasticity yeah, just to hyper it. Hyper realistic animation. I got it. <laughs> and I'm not, and I'm not speaking out of my ass when I say this because I was watching this with Meg, 
who ha- who is an animator and has a fucking master's degree in animation. And was like, you yeah, know, this is really, really good. <laughs> like, again, not hyper-realistic, but, like, so fluid and, and, and expressive in a way that Spongebob typically isn't. So anyway, this woman is chased into the corner by the ghost of her grandmother. Then it, like, zooms out and we see that this in-universe horror movie is being played on uh, Karen's head. And Plankton is watching it with popcorn and he's like, yeah, get her, Grandma, get her! Which is quite funny. Yeah. Patrick falls off his sofa and then realizes, wait, if I was a ghost, I would be able to sneak into the Krusty Krab and steal the formula. And Karen is then really pissed off and is like, ah, you ruined another movie night with your obsession with this formula. I'm powering down. And she goes into the corner and unplugs herself. And uh, Plankton is like, oh, you know what? Screw that. I'm going to continue on this plan. So he creates... A machine, which is shaped like a skull, and it uh, literally is designed to extract the soul from his body. What? And That's not science! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a machine that can extract a soul from your body. It's called a gun. <laughs> yeah, but like, also oh, he shapes it like a skull? I mean, he, he's, he's an evil villain, so we'll give him that. He knows he's one of the baddies, I suppose. Uh, as we know, like the, the central joke of Plankton, especially in New Spongebob, is the fact that he is perhaps the greatest scientist known to man, or, or to fish, um, but, he, but he wastes it on trying to become a slightly more successful restaurateur Restaurant than, owner. Yeah. <laughs> than the fucking uh, going downhill greasy spoon. Across the road from him. The fucking crabsers. Yes. So, anyway, he turns on this machine and extracts his soul from his body. And he comes out as this, like, fun little green ghost with a tail. And he looks down at his own, like, corpse, which looks weirdly, like, dried up and dead. And he goes, oh, it looks like I've seen a ghost. But it's been seconds. Do Plankton's just rot that quickly? Um, well, he, he's not rotten. He's just desiccated and dried up. And he, you know, looks at his own corpse and says, Oh, you look like you've seen a ghost. Laughs and leaves. So he's basically invented a machine uh, that yeah. killed him. So he, his ghost can go and steal the Krabby Patty formula, which I imagine would be somewhat of a hollow victory. Uh, plot, plot twist. Can he not hold the Krusty Krab formula as a we'll ghost? We'll get to that. So he goes across the road and he goes into the safe. And he can't hold the Krusty Krab formula as a ghost. And he hears this laughter and he goes outside and sitting in Mr. Krabs' chair, spinning around and giggling, is the Flying Dutchman. Oh, so they could pay for him to be in this episode, but not the Hell Spirit one. To be fair, this is a better episode. (laughs) Well, all right then. This is one of those ones that's weird, but not bad. Incidentally, written by Mr. Lawrence. Oh, okay. He's the one good writer left, and he's the voice of fucking Plankton. Yeah. Anyway, so the Flying Dutchman is like, ah, oh, you're a newbie. Like, you, 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 you have no idea what it takes to be a ghost. And, uh, but he says, like, you know, I've taken a shine to you, though. I'll, like, if you think you're man enough, I can teach you how to be a good ghost. It's like, okay, so lesson one is scaring people. And, like, each time there's, like, a lesson... Like a, like a fucking, uh, like a card comes up on the screen that's like a a tombstone with like the lesson name etched into the tombstone, which is quite fun and creative. I feel like there was an episode where like Spongebob was helping the Dutchman get his scare back, which was very similar to this in the way that like, except the Dutchman was the one doing like Rocky montages to get better at scaring. There was, yeah, there was, there was, but in a sense, this one is more kind of like, um, Plankton is taking advantage of the Dutchman's goodwill, because ultimately he doesn't actually want to scare people, he just knows that one of the later lessons is being able to hold things as a ghost. Right, okay, but even if he can hold the formula, can he get it out of the safe? We'll get there! Oh my god. We'll get there! Oh my god. Okay, the final Dutchman says, okay, we're gonna teach you how to scare... And uh, he says, they're waiting in a dark alley. And I say, oh, here's the first victim coming now. Let me show you. 
he runs, uh, and this, like, robber, like, you know, sort of, like, striped sweater with, like, a bag of swag. Does he got, like, a ski cap over his head? Uh, no, but he has, like, the, he has, like, a, uh, like, a wool cap and, like, a bandit mask. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So the dude runs up, and the Flying Dutchman goes up to him and does, like, this kind of nightmarish face. The dude screams. His skin falls off. His bones crack and disappear. He just becomes a nervous system, so like a walking nervous Ugh. system with the brain and the eyes, and then runs away. Ugh. Plankton goes and does this. He's like, oh, I see someone to scare. He goes and does it. But he accidentally scares himself on a reflective surface, and the same thing happens to him. And uh, the Flanders was like, you scared yourself, but you know what? Technically, that counts too. And, like, wax him back into his body. And it's like, okay, lesson two. Like, haunting. And uh, then Plankton possesses Squidward's bed. And right. uh, sort of, like, taunts him by, like, spraying, like, green goo on him. And, like, turning the headboard into a mouth that, like, tries to eat him. And Squidward, like, runs away. At which point, like, Plankton, like, manifests looking like Spongebob to terrify Squidward. Mm. And uh, it works. And in the process... Plankton realizes that the secret to being able to hold things is if you get angry enough, you can. Yeah, okay, so typical ghost rule. The more pissed off you are, the more ghost things you can do. Yeah, I mean, we we often run with, like, a similar principle with Evelyn. I, yeah, no, no, like, I'm not even knocking it. I think that is true. I mean, poltergeists are typically, like, they they typically throw things around when they, like, don't want people around, so... Yeah, they're fucking pissed. So, Plankton goes into the safe again, uh, tries to take out the uh, secret former, but, you guessed it, can't get it out of the safe. Because he got to unlock the safe Because, you know, it's still side. a solid. Yeah. Something Meg pointed out, obviously this wouldn't happen, because it's a children's cartoon, but uh, <laughs> Meg, Meg said... Why doesn't he just take the cork off inside and, like, read it and memorize it? Yeah! What? Why doesn't he just do that? That would be the... Like, dude, bring up... A... Like, the, the guy's a super genius. He probably has the memory to remember the recipe to a fucking burger. Yeah, but at the same time, why does he care so much about the burger? Like, Eat even, the fuck out of me, even man. in the Spongebob movie, which is great, it's, it's fantastic. It's a fitting, like cap to like the series they still extend plankton's plan from getting the crusty crab formula to taking over the town with mind control like the stakes are raised because at the end of the day like the stealing of the crusty crab formula is a sitcom nemesis plot it doesn't really have any actual stakes for anyone involved Exactly, and the reason it doesn't have stakes is that, like, ultimately, everyone, I think even kids know, Plankton's never actually going to steal it. Yeah, it's like nobody watches The Roadrunner and thinks Wiley's going to win at the end of that episode. Exactly, exactly, because, you know, the show would be done, it would cease to be. Yeah. Anyway, so, Plankton flies back to the Chum Bucket and finds that there is a funeral for him going on. Why did he... Stay out of his body for so long! Well, because obviously, like, Karen must have, like, plugged herself back in and, like, seen the corpse and not known what the machine did. That's... And, wow. like, he's there watching, like, people mourn him. And then the Flying Dutchman turns up and is like, Ha-ha! Uh, you, you fool, you're not gonna be able to go back into your body. Plankton goes, No, you idiot. Like, I'm not actually dead. Because of my machine, I'm just temporarily out of my body. And the Flying Dutchman goes, oh, so that means it's up for grabs then. And takes over Plankton's Why? body. Why? Why would you want to go from being like an infinitely powerful ghost monster to a Plankton? Well, that's the thing, because he does that. And then everyone is really pissed that Plankton's still alive. Because they feel like, oh, we wasted our sympathy on you. So they start like stomping on him. That's horrifying. That's ghoulish. What? And so at this point, the Flying Dutchman leaps out of the body and is like, ah. <laughs> There's this kind of horrifying line where he gives Plankton's body back to him and says, I'd rather be dead as me than be alive as you. Jesus! That's too <laughs> Actual much! Line from the... Oh no! So the Flying Dutchman uh, gives his body back. Plankton re-inhabits the body 
He's like, ah, oh, feels good to be back. And then everyone surrounds him and starts stomping on him again. But Plankton is happy with it and he's like, ah, oh, just like old times. And then uh, end card. But the end card is up for a second. And then the flying Dutchman leaps into frame, jump scares the audience, and then laughs. Wait, why? What purpose does that serve? I assume from this double bill, these had to have been Halloween episodes. Maybe mine were too. Maybe that's what ties these all together. Because, like, for some reason, this all just feels so... uh, ghostly and ghoulish, you know what I'm saying? And I don't use those words lightly. We take that very seriously around here. Yeah, again, like, it's it's fucking weird that we who, like, our main fictional thing outside of YouTube is all the like, ghosts and ghouls. Yes. And, like, horror parodies. Yeah. All right. So, um, now that we have recounted the horrifying tales from the chilling depths of of the scary ocean. Do you want to guess, take a guess, which of mine, if any, were not real? Okay. All which right. Mean, don't look now and seance schmeance. This is a tricky one. Now, the thing is, the degree of bad that they are, I could fully believe that both are real. But I want to be a little bit sexy about this. E- like, I would rather, like, have a daring guess and be wrong, almost, than make the safe mm. guess and be right. So I'm going to say, seance, schmeance, real, don't look now, fake. Well, you're half right, because they're both real. <sighs> All right, now you take mine on. So, I have unfortunately seen in the past screenshots of The Ghost of Plankton, so I know that one's real. But I desperately don't want my two crabses to be real. So I'm going to hope that's fake. Hey, Gus. Yeah? You're half right. <laughs> Are you... Oh, no! Do you want to quickly, you quickly look up some stills from my two crabses? <laughs> yeah, let me, yeah, let me just see. My two crabses. I need to see this flesh monster you described. Um. Also the fat ass. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta see the fat ass. Images. Oh no, I... (laughs) I... I really hate fake crabs. I don't like that at all. He's bad. (laughs) Troy Devil in My Two Crabs is fat ass. (laughs) Let's see if we can find the true horror centerpiece of this episode. uh, I... Why do I do this? No. So I'm not gonna attempt that again. Because you know what? For some reason, what? I typed in my two crabs' fat asses. You know what showed up? The first image. What? The first image was the guy from SpongeBob the movie going, My eyes. <laughs> That's me. After seeing Krabs' fat ass. And like literally every other picture, I shit you not, was like my little pony character fan art. No! <laughs> I. D- like. D- like somehow it got worse somehow after all this it got worse i also have to appreciate that both of the episodes that each of us got were so strange that like you know off the top of our heads how could we come up with anything stranger fucking eerie that they would all be so thematically close yeah like somehow or other that's what this was. I feel like I need to burn some fucking sage after this record. Yeah, like, th- like we have, we have, you know, put a curse onto our houses! Yeah, like, just, modern Spongebob is so strange that, um, the two writers behind Moby Tit thought, well, we can outcurse this. Yeah, I, like, I just, I just don't know anymore, man. I think that, I think that we have seen... Some some shit. We've seen some terrible shit, dude. I kind of wish Morby could just come in and get this fucking show over yeah, with. Yeah, get this show off the air. Because, like, my god. Hell spirits? Ghosts? Fat asses? What are they doing these days? 
Oh my god, that's that's I I think that's the uh the whole thing. It's Pyramid Head climbing out of Mr. Krabs' fat ass. Oh it's Silent Hill, but the hills are the ass, and it's anything but silent. This has been SpongeBob Boys, and as always, you weren't ready. No.